I know you have some important achievements that maybe you should talk about. Being the first independent female winemaker in Santa Barbara County and the first to dedicate the entire winery to Pinot Noir. Yes, um, you know, the independent female winemaker, I, I, you know, I've been doing this since 19, I've been in my, my own business since 1984. And I did not realize that fact until probably maybe four years ago, maybe five. Uh, and it was one of those things I'd always felt I was, you know, I knew I was one of the first, but I thought this older woman uh, that was making wine here was the first woman. And then I talked to a gentleman, uh, well, Jim Clendenin, who owns Au Bon Clement. And he was, he was saying, oh no, Mary never actually made her own wine. She had them made up north and then shipped down in bottles. So that means I became number one. <laughs> it's good to be number one. <laughs> yeah, so that was kind of exciting, definitely. Um, just, just one of those things I didn't, I didn't realize until, you know, like I said, until just recently. And then it's like, oh my God, we can use that as, you know, PR for sure. Um, and the, the other one was, you know, strictly Pinot Noir. Now, under the Lane Tanner, Tanner label, I am, I made nothing but Pinot Noir because really that was the only wine I truly loved. I mean, you know, even to this day, every night I drink Pinot Noir. I just, that's, that's, that's the wine that works for my body chemistry. Um, I, I don't know, but I think, you know, we all have different body chemistries and, 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 you know, even with, when we do tastings, like, you know, what I taste and what you taste is going to be slightly different, but also how, how alcohol affects us. Each one of us is different. Like, Think of it like a football. If you're at a football game, and instead of everybody drinking beer, if they all drank wine, what the difference would be? Mm -hmm. Well, I think each one of us also has that variant about, you know, what alcohol works best in our system. And I've gotten it down to not only just what alcohol, wine obviously works best with my system, but Pinot Noir, it's, it's kind of like liquid Valium to me. And I can sit down at the end of the day and I can have a glass of white wine and I'll be, it'll be like nice, but I won't get calm. And then I'll have a glass of Pinot Noir and I just, it calms me right down. I, you know, I, I can't tell you exactly why, but it's really interesting. Making Pinot Noir must be magic for you because I know it's a fussy little grape. <laughs> you know, it's, it's magic and it's also make you want to shoot yourself in the foot some days. Um, there was uh, Andre Tilichev had this saying that that God made Cabernet and the devil made Pinot Noir, uh, and because I've been making it for so long, I you know I, I don't think of it as as maddening as I used to think of it. But what I have found now that the, the Lumen label, because we're making other wines, is and I hate to say this because it sounds kind of weird, but how easy it is to make other wines. <laughs> <laughs> Pinot Noir, you make it. And you know, one month you'll taste the barrels and think, oh my God, what happened? And then the next month you'll taste it and think, oh, it's perfect. And then the next month it's something else. It's like, you know, like when little kids grow up, how they change every month, how their, their whole face changes. Like, oh, now you look like your mother. Now you look like your dad. That's what you know is all about too. I swear to goodness, it just, it's always changing. And you learn when you make Pinot Noir, don't mess with it. Don't believe it. Do not, do not get sucked into to the, oh my God, something's wrong with it this month. It's like, no, let it go. Don't touch it. It'll be fine by next month. You know, have faith in yourself. Well, that's basically your philosophy. Besides picking early, as I understand it, you like to pick early in, in, yeah. the, in the vineyard. But your other philosophy is just really don't touch it much after that. And that's, that's because, yeah, growing up with making Pinot, that, that is, that's what you learn is, yeah, don't be messing with it. And, you know, you, you just, it works. If you, oh. if you really know that you, you pick good sound grapes, you know the steps you've gone through have been, have been you know, time proven, then you know that end product will be okay. Just, just have faith. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about your uh, pick early philosophy? Um, you know, in okay, we, we have to go back to the first part. When I when I first started making wine on my own in '84, most people at that point were uh, picking really and truly more for um, the jammy, dark flavors. You know, everybody was this big hang time. It was you know, it was like this new buzzword now. You know, everybody says hang time. We all know what it is, but back then, like hang time, what does that mean? <laughs> and, uh, 
And so the, the, big, the big thing is, oh, we gotta let it hang as far as possible. Now, in reality though, in Santa Maria Valley, hang time for Pinot Noir, you were lucky to get it to like 22 because, because we have this fog, which makes Pinot Noir growing perfect. But Pinot Noir ripening, oh my God, because this was back before we had leaf pulling. So if you don't pull leaves, you get a lot of condensate in, you know, in the undercarriage and your, your Pinot Noir, which is the thinnest skin grape, rots. So it was always this thing about hang time. It's like, well, if you leave it out there, it's just going to get more rotten. So I was just totally into thinking about not doing it that way. And I was also lucky enough to be put up in a lab uh, with this grower. He had a whole bunch of, of acreage. Uh, he actually, he did a lot of acreage for the bank, which Caldwell Bank back there um, owned a lot of vineyards that had gone under. And so he, he, uh, he dealt with all these and he was trying to get winemakers to pick earlier because so many winemakers would just call in and they wouldn't go check the vineyards. They would just say, I want the grapes at 23. Well, as I just explained, getting, getting grapes at 23 was almost impossible for Pinot Noir. So he set me up in the lab and we would do samples, constantly do samples. And I was realizing as I'm tasting these different grapes that uh, you know, at about 20, they were green and ugly. And then a lot of times around 21, 21, five, he started tasting fabulous, like this in sparkly, scintillating flavors. And then, you know, by 22, we're starting to see rot. By 23, garbage, you know? So uh, that, was, that was how I learned that the fact that there's this little window right after it goes from green to, to you know, right, getting the green flavors away, that it's just, it's fabulous fruit. It's just, it's so exciting. And nobody was picking them. And, and that's, that was how I got my style. I just said, this is the fruit I want. I want the healthy fruit. I want the, the exciting, flavorful fruit. And uh, that's how come I started picking that way. And once the grapes are picked, like I said, you, your philosophy is minimal intervention. You do add some yeast and you add some sulfites, but you are allergic to sulfur. And, uh, you know, you'll even see, even with a little bit that we'll be tasting this morning, my, my face will get really flushed. I'm just super allergic to sulfites. It's one of the things now, I've, as a scientist, you know, there's, I, I always am looking at this kind of stuff. And I've read a number of articles that say that certain things like like sulfides uh, can build up. So, you know, I probably in the 80s wasn't as allergic, but as I get more and more exposure, and it's not just sulfides and wine, of course, we use, we use sulfur in the barrels for, you know, for keeping our barrels sound and uh, sulfur gas for a lot of different things. I, I've just become more and more sensitive to it. So, yeah, all the ones that I do make are very low in, in sulfides and mm -hmm. sulfur dioxide addition. I just I can't drink them otherwise. And that's also why we pretty much stay away from making sweet wines because then here again, you just have to add a lot of sulfides to, to keep those wines. Oh. Yeah. But on the good side now, because I do pick early, my pHs are much lower than most people's. Now pH, you have pH and you have acid. And those, those are not exactly one-on-one -on -one relation, but they have kind of a relation. So, so when I pick early, my acids are a little higher, my pHs are a little lower. And low pH actually works as a preservative for wine also. So, so I have the added bonus because I pick early of having uh, lower pHs that, that are preservative towards my wine. So I don't have to worry so much about adding the SO2s. Wow, that's genius. Yeah. You know, it just works out. <laughs> Some of those things you didn't start doing it, but then I started realizing, hey, look at this. <laughs> there's, there's two possibilities for headaches in wines. And one is sulfides and the other one is tannins. Um, all of my wines are also low in tannins because I do 100% de-stemming. So I do not believe in stems because really here again, when you pick early, your stems are green and you don't want that green horrible flavor in your wine. So, so right there, I, I threw them out. Uh, and I'm not a real fan of, of wines that do have stems in them. They, they have a tendency to, to just kind of be off. It's like, I spent so much for this fruit. Why do I want to mess it up with other stuff? You know, I just want that berry. I want that pure fruit juice to start my, my wines with.
I, not to not to bang on larger larger wineries, but when you when you have a tank that that holds maybe twenty thousand gallons or more, you've got to preserve that somehow. I mean, you can't you can't take a risk that that just you know, a little bit of sulfide is going to be okay. So, you know the 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 big you know the big chain places usually have a, a much larger amount of sulfides and it's not just free because there's there's two sulfides there's there's total and there's free now total sulfides i just just say i, I okay i have a wine and it's never had sulfide in it so i add 20 parts of sulfur dioxide and of that sulfur dioxide some of it actually gets bound up and that doesn't help the wine at all staying preserved. Only the free will help it stay preserved. So a certain amount of it will get bound up and then maybe only five, five uh, parts per million is the free and that's what's preserving the wine. Well, uh, if you have a big tank, you want that number to be pretty darn high. I would think at least 40 or 50 free SO2. So, how much sulfur do you have to add in to a tank to, to, you know, to, to, to get the free up that high? So um, I know now I'm geeking out on you, but, but it all has to do with pH. A lot of it has to do with pH. Um, and because my pHs are low here again, the, uh, the free sulfur and the total sulfur are pretty darn close. Um, this one, for instance, um, I think my total sulfur was 54 and my free was about 25 when it was bottled. It probably right now is running maybe about 10 uh, organic wine sulfurs are 10 or less. So, so I'm in the organic wine area. Um, and I bet if we, if we took a, a large, just any off the shelf, you know, a large, large winery and looked at it, you'd be looking at probably a total of at least over a hundred, probably closer to two or three hundred, and a free of maybe about forty. Now here again, forty is almost undetectable too, but it's detectable by our bodies, and that's the problem. And and total is also detectable by our bodies. Although people say, oh no, you can't detect it. It's like, turns out my body can. Yeah, okay. I that that really those high the high totals, even though you can't taste them or smell them, they affect your body. Oh, yeah. I, I, I totally believe that. I mean, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> right. I don't think doctors know this either. So, so I think we're safe enough. So when you pick the grapes, then you go through the process of destemming. I would imagine that that would be kind of a tedious, long process to, to do. You that. know, they have pretty good destemmers nowadays. It used to be a lot harder uh, when we had back in the you know back in the eighties. They they called them crushers, and they called them crushers for a reason because they they really did crush the grapes. And unfortunately, they also crushed the the stems. But they you know they did remove the juice and the and the skins from the stems, so they did work. But but you still got a lot of stem juice. So you still had a lot of tannins. Um, nowadays, we call them destemmers. We pay more for them. <laughs> but they're very gentle. They, they have these fingers and they just knock all the berries off the stem. So the stems come out whole, the berries drop down whole. Uh, it's just, we get a lot better fruit nowadays because of that. So your partner's with Will Henry. He was born into a family of wines, the Henry Wine Group. So he brought uh, his experience. So the two of you teamed up to make Lumen Wines. And tell me what Lumen Wines means. Well, Lumen is, is a, there's, there's a few different uh, definitions of Lumen. But in this case, Lumen is a, a, the, a unit of light intensity. So, you know, when you, when you go to buy a light bulb, they actually, they say, you know, 39 lumens or 150 lumens or in some of the ones I use on my, my, uh, my fish tank, you know, we're talking 2,500 lumens. <laughs> so it's a unit of light. Um, Will is a photographer. Well, that's one of the many things he does. But um, he, so, he, so he's, he works with light, of course, a lot. And um, he, just to kind of go back into the story, he... Uh, he decided, well, his dad owns the Henry Wine Group. He, uh, he wanted to make a wine, and not actually make a wine, but make a product wine, of course, that he could just, you know, he, he, he had the, the idea, he had the name, he even made his label, which I'll get into in a minute here, 
and then he uh, he went to find bulk wine and uh, he was going to just fill these bottles and hand them over to his dad uh, let his dad sell the wine and then he could just take the money and go surfing that was his big plan <laughs> so um when um that was when, a good plan yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been easier for him. I tell you. <laughs> but uh, this is a uh, this is in 2013, early 2013, because I just I just finished the 2012 vintage for a, a vineyard called Sierra Madre, my favorite vineyard here in Santa Maria Valley, and they had a, they had a label Sierra Madre Vineyards. Well, the gentleman that owned that label, uh, Doug Circle, was a strawberry grower by training and making wine and putting it in a bottle was just just it made him crazy because I mean with strawberries you've got a, you've got like a what a, like a three-day turnaround time with wine you're looking at two to five year turnaround time and so it just he was going crazy so I said to him I said you know you don't have to be in this business I mean my goodness the guy had at least 15 other businesses that were all very successful so he had nothing to prove and he didn't need the money specifically. I said, you know, why don't you just do yourself a favor and just get out of this part of the business? And I, I thought if he decided to do that, that we would bottle the wine I made for him and then he'd stop. And but then one day he came to me and said, Lane, I totally agree with you. We're gonna bulk out all the wines. I think it, no, not my children. <laughs> <laughs> so I got used the idea and uh, one day, Doug calls me and says, Lane, why don't you come to the tasting room? We got somebody that's interested in, in looking at our bulk wines. So I, I brought, brought the samples to the tasting room and uh, I'm walking in and Will Henry's walking in at the same time. And I, I looked at Will because the Henry Wine Group had sold my, my Lane Tanner label forever. So I knew the whole family pretty well. And I said, hey, Will, you know, what are you doing here? And he looked at me and said, well, Lane, what are you doing here? <laughs> And we went into the meeting and it turns out he was there to buy bulk and I was there to sell bulk. So uh, we made a deal. He, he just loved it. And uh, it was the kind of one he was looking for. So he, he bought, he bought it, <laughs> but he was, this is so sweet. Okay. So he, he didn't really have a good idea of what you do at this process. He just, you know, he had the bottle idea, the label concept already down the name. He had that whole thing done. So, so he bought, bought the, the bulk wine, which was all in barrel. And um, about, I don't know, two or three weeks later, I, I nothing happens. So I called him and I said, well, well, Will, um, when are you gonna come pick up your wine? And he goes, pick up my wine? And I said, yeah, you know, I take it to your wine. He says, my winery. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that he just buys bulk and somehow it shows up at his door in bottles. <laughs> <laughs> So I made a deal with him that I would help him, you know, finish the wine out and get it in the bottle, which I did. Then that was kind of the end of it. Um, and then I guess, oh, I don't know, about a month later, he called me and said, you know, I really like this wine. I like, you know, the whole concept. He said, I think I'd like to, to actually make the wine and put it in a bottle instead of just buying bulk. And he said, I'd like you to be my winemaker. And I said, oh, no way. Because I just thought, oh, Jeeves, you know, this guy doesn't even know you buy bulk and, you know, <laughs> put it in a bottle. So um, he, he really, he asked me about two more times. And then what finally won me, besides the fact that, that he's just such a sweet person and really a good looking man, was the fact that uh, he offered to actually pay me also, <laughs> besides being a partner. So I mean, okay, I can be your partner and get paid what's not to like about that deal so that's that's how he and I ended up you know being partners and and you know starting Lumen together on a, on a different level from what he was taking it to I, I you know I, I graduated from San Jose State and I have a degree in chemistry I uh, I planned to be a chemist but right after college I fell into the air and water quality uh, profession and I ended up just going all over different places and building towers and checking air and water quality. And I am, uh, it was pretty interesting. You know, I got to work on the North Slope. I got to work at uh, Hoover Dam. I, I went to a lot of really interesting places, but I got really tired of traveling. So I thought, you know, I really want to get back into hardcore chemistry. So I, I quit that, that profession and went back up to Lake County where I'm from, which is Northern California, and was spending the summer on my mom's couch thinking that you know, when it comes to be fall, I'm going to go to San Francisco and find a real chemistry job. So one day the phone rings. My mom was at work and there was a local winery called Canoctai Winery 
that um, was looking for somebody to help them bottle. And I thought, well, you know, what the heck, I can do that for a day. So I went down helping them bottle. They found out I was a chemist. So they said, while you're in town, can you maybe do some chemistry for us? Because it's, it's harvest for us. And I thought, well, probably, you know, I have no clue what that might be, but, you know, show me the cookbook and I could do it. So I go in Monday morning, have no idea. And I, I didn't drink wine at that time. Um, yeah, not at all. <laughs> but, but, okay, so I go in Monday morning and I'm sitting in the lab waiting for somebody to come in and tell me what to do. And nobody did. And I'm waiting and waiting. And pretty soon the winemaker comes in. His name was Bill Pease. And uh, he had a consultant with him. I didn't realize he was a consultant, but he just, he had this guy with him. It was a really little tiny guy and uh, one big old eyebrow. And I'm introduced to this guy as the new enologist. And I'm standing there because I'm, you know, like, how do you do? And I think I wonder what that word means because <laughs> enologist, of course, as a scientist, I knew that, but enologist, I'd never even heard the word. So the, the, uh, the consultant happened to be Andre Chalachov. And he says, let's have Lane taste with us. We're, we're sitting down and, and tasting. It's like the first time you've ever tasted wine. And literally, this was it, you know, under pressure, because, you know, I'm, I'm here with two people I don't know, and they both seem like, think that I'm the enologist, and I don't know what that word is. So I'm, I'm seriously intimidated. So the first thing they do, of course, they pour the wine, and then they swirl. And then they have me, you know, take a sip. It's like, okay, I can do that. They're doing the little, little, little thing. I can do that. Okay, I can do that. And then they spit into spittoons. So Andre hands me this coffee cup. And I didn't even spit into it because you know what? Back back then, women are not really trained to spit. I mean, I drooled into it, basically. And uh, then he starts peppering me with these questions. You know, what can you, you know, can you, can you taste? What do you taste? What do you smell? And it turns out, this is so weird, but I'd always had this incredible sense of taste and smell. And I'd never thought about it as anything but a horrible, horrible problem. I'm always the one that, you know, the high school class goes to Fishman's Wharf and everybody's, oh, this is so fun. And I'm just, I'm nauseated from the smell of the crabs cooking on the street. You know, it just, uh, it never, I never even thought of this as a positive thing. And this guy's like, oh my God, you can taste and smell that? You know, and so he's, he's, he's complimenting me. And then he starts saying, well, Lane, once a week, you need to do this. And once and, and he, he might as well have been speaking Russian because really and truly, it made no sense. Nothing he said makes sense because I had no background in what he was talking about, none. But I'm just like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Thinking, you know, sooner or later they'll leave and somebody will tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. So they go to lunch. And now I'm back in the lab and I'm, I'm a little high. And I still have no clue what I'm doing. And uh, I just sit there. I didn't think to bring my lunch. So literally, I'm just sitting there the whole hour. And Bill Pease, the winemaker, comes back and says, Lane, is there any way you can stay and be our enologist? Because Andre really likes you. And that is how I became an enologist, from zero to enologist in four hours. <laughs> with no training, with no understanding of the wine industry, nothing. <laughs> That's a great yeah, story. Is, yeah. This is the first vineyard that we have. Um, yeah, Werner Henry Vineyard, this is his dad. His dad passed away last year, right around this time. Um, and about three, four years ago, he, well, Bill and his wife, Callie, bought a piece of property in Santa Maria Valley that had 11 acres and a small house. So now he's putting about seven acres of it into Pinot Noir, uh, pretty much as we speak. So, and that'll be the Warner Henry Vineyard. And the 1% for the planet is you take 1% of your gross, not your profits, which, which makes this kind of special. Mm -hmm. So for 1% of our whole gross, uh, we hand that over to uh, environmental groups. I, I know, I think what he hands it over to mostly, and I'm, I'm guessing here, but I'm thinking is save the waves which is a, is a, a, a group that, that tries to go around the world and buy property where the coastline is being developed, but it's a really good surf spot too, so that they can maintain the surfing. And actually, Will was the one that, that, that started that, oh gosh, I don't know, maybe back in the 70s. Is that right? They do testing too, don't they? They get people to test for them 
all the surfers, they get them to go out and test the water and send in samples for them? Uh, you know what? I really don't have that background. I don't know, but it, it would make sense. Okay. Because you want clean water, definitely. Yeah. I think I've heard of this organization before. Same. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty cool organization. Mm -hmm. So the 1% for the planet, is that a, a group of wineries that belong to that organization? I think it's a group of any, any, anybody that, that has a business. It's not just wineries. It's any business can be part of that, can sign up for it and, and, and like I said, that's the coolest part is it's not, you know, if you have a profit, you give 1%, it's 1% it's of the gross, which I prefer, I, I would personally prefer we put it into equipment. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's really noble that they do that. Yeah. Definitely. They're sustainably certified and biodynamic. So can right, you explain yes. exactly a little bit about what that means. Okay, um, biodynamic is is almost like a religion. I don't know if you've ever come across it before, but it's really interesting. Biodynamic, there's how do you even say that? There's certain phases of the moon when you do things. You can only pick during certain phases during certain days. The um, and a lot of this stuff is really good. Like they, they don't use any chemicals. Um, they, uh, they, they believe in, you know, pretty much doing everything as positive for the ground as possible. There's, there's some interesting things like uh, for New Year's Eve on, on, you know, at midnight New Year's Eve, you're supposed to take a cow horn and fill it full of something. And I'm not sure what, and then bury it in the ground. And that will, that will assure you that, that everything is gonna work that year. Uh, I do remember at one time hearing that, that, that I this I can't swear to it, but I swear to it as I, I did hear it. I'm just not sure this is biodynamic, but you take gophers and then you, you incinerate them and then you, you, you throw gopher dust everywhere and then the gopher dust keeps other gophers away. Um, wow, so, I have not yeah, heard that. <laughs> if that worked, man, I'd be doing all this stuff. <laughs> gopher <laughs> dust everywhere. <laughs> Actually, but uh, you know, so it, it's 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 really it's really really positive, and it's between a very positive organic methods and a church. That's the only way I can describe it because it, people that that do biodynamic, you don't be messing with them, you don't be laughing. They truly believe that that horn in the ground is going to make a difference, and right. and but the truth is, is they they do things wonderfully. I mean, it's it's better than organic, if you will. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, SIP certified is more realistic. What that means is these people are dedicated to not using any, any class one chemicals, so no really bad chemicals on the ground. They want to they want to make everything sustainable, and that means also paying your workers enough money that they can actually live, and you making a profit so that you can you can sustain your farm too. So it's 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 a kind of a it just makes more sense. They, these people, uh, they're, they're really caring about their workers. Usually the workers get uh, two physicals a year at the winery. The workers have to do calisthenics in the morning. Um, and the, you know, people, they're, 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 the people that own the vineyards are just really honed in on, on making sure that the workers are healthy and safe and are getting enough money to, to survive. Um, plus the fact that they, they really try to maintain the health of the vineyard as much as possible too, because I mean, that's part of it. The, the sustainability is, is the owner, the vineyard and the workers. Wine enthusiast loves you. <laughs> I'm so glad somebody does. <laughs> I mean, they love- The spectator does not. <laughs> but the wine enthusiast loves your wine. All four that you sent us are all been rated highly with wine enthusiasts. And you offer a pack of four wines that people can buy where it's wine enthusiasts highly rated, which right. I've never seen before. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's here again style. You know, I just, I happen to have a style of winemaking that, uh, that they, they like right at the moment. I mean, it, it's, it's one of those times and places. Um, you know, if I, if I was making a, a 16 alcohol cab with lots of lots of interesting flavors, I would be the darling of wine spectator. But, you know, I'm in, I'm in Santa Barbara County and I'm, 
I'm making lovely, lovely softer wines and that's what wine enthusiasts really likes right now. And if you look at it, this is the nighttime sky uh, in the Western hemisphere during harvest. So all the, all the little stars are actually in the exact right place. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I can see the big dipper and the little dipper, but after that, I don't know any of the stars. That's it. <laughs> wow. That's great. So cheers. Cheers. <laughs> so this is where we're tasting. We're tasting the Pinot Gris, and this is the 2018. This is from Sierra Madre Vineyard. And that you said that was your favorite vineyard. The Pinot Noir on that vineyard is sacred. There's, I, I love Santa Maria Valley for Pinot Noir, but um, out of all of Santa Maria Valley, that specific vineyard sits almost right in the middle, just a touch to the south. And the way the valleys, you know, in most of California, you know, your valleys run north south, but here in Santa Barbara, the valleys run east-west, so they're open to the ocean. This vineyard is probably, <coughs> oh, I would say maybe 15 miles, 18 miles from the ocean. So it gets total ocean um, feels. It, it, gets the, it gets the fog in the morning and the fog in the evening, especially about harvest time, which, you know, as I said before, leaf pulling was a real problem, but now it just so we have it, it makes it Mediterranean. Pinot Noir loves Mediterranean. They like they like warm nights, cool days, just the opposite of what Cabernet wants. And that vineyard, that specific vineyard, is just in the exact zone for perfect Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens it also is awesome for whites too. The Pinot Gris and the Chardonnay both fabulous. I love the peachy flavor, the cantaloupe and. Mm, melon. And here again, um, you'll notice there's not a whole lot of oak in this either. I, back to that, I'm fruit driven. I don't really appreciate a lot of oak in my wine because oak, I mean, it's a beautiful flavor, but you can't a lot of times taste the oak from the grapes. And it, it just makes me crazy when somebody says, oh, this is a great, a great blah. And I taste it and think, well, it's great oak, but there's no fruit here. So all of my wines are very low in oak also. So this actually has no new oak. I, what I do is I use my one-year-old barrels. I first off use the barrels um, for the first time with the Chardonnay. And then the, after that, the second year, when they're a lot softer flavors, that's what I use. That's why I put the Pinot Gris in. So it never has new oak. It just has a touch of one-year-old. Another thing that I do that that helps make the smoothness of these wines is, um, and it's kind of back to the, the low tannin thing. You know, we've already talked about destemming. Well, with, with white grapes, of course, you bring the grapes in and you put them straight into the press. And I use a bladder press, which, you know, is pretty soft. Um, and I use it on a setting for champagne. So, so it never gets up very high pressure wise. And what happens is I don't even go all the way through that setting. At about the last, the last fifth of that setting, I just turn the press off because it'll go, it goes higher. So I, this, the, these grapes never go past one atmosphere pressure on, on pressing, which means I just get the really soft stuff. I never break up any seeds because that's what happens when you take that pressure up a little higher. You start crushing seeds and then you get seed tannins, which can cause the harshness. Now it also, of course, increases how much how much wine per ton you get. So, you know, almost every winery out there, of course, is taking that last, you know, maybe 10, 15 gallons. And, and that is a lot to lose, but at the same time, what we're losing in quantity, we're making up in quality. So I just feel that that's, it's a, it's a good trade-off. I know your tasting room is at Pico restaurant. You must be good at pairing food with your wines. Oh, uh, you know, I think we're all good at it at this point. It, it's, and that's one of the most fun things to do is, is pairing food and wine. Up. And, and sometimes you get it kind of right. Sometimes you, you totally miss the mark, but then sometimes when you get it perfect, it elevates both the food and the wine, which is the most exciting thing. It really is. Um, this Pinot Gris, I think, I think the best pairing I ever had with this was, um, Oyster, not oysters, they were mussels. They were smoked mussels. 
-hmm. and then steam, steam is slightly smoked. Uh, you just in a, a slight broth with a little garlic. Um, it just both, both of this is just because I don't have a lot of oak here. So the little smokiness of the, of the mussels, you know, added that smoke flavor that I might not have here. And then this, because of the, the good acid base, just brought that up. And because there's no harshness of this wine, you, the delicacy of the mussels and the delicacy of the sauce, you know, the, the broth wasn't overwhelmed either. So it was really a great combination. And the wine enthusiast really likes the rest your restaurant. Yeah, yeah. You know, that wine enthusiast is pretty darn nice to us. <laughs> because it's the top 100 wine restaurants for the for two years in a row. Yeah, um, you know, and, and it, it does make sense because I have to tell you, being the son of Warner Henry does have its perks. And one of them is Warner Henry has this huge, huge library of wines. And I will go down and kind of shops at his dad's, uh, his dad's wine, wine, you know, group. He just, he just goes down and takes some of those old things that his dad has like been sitting on forever, thinking he's gonna, you know, drink them sometime or another, and takes them up to the uh, restaurant. So, so, and also, all, all of the Lane Tanner wines that I had, I had a library of a few pallets. I sold those to Will, so he has all my old vintages too, um, which makes a pretty nice list. The other nice thing I like is, you know, every time we get to make a new wine, they, they figure out new colors. Now, right now, this is Will's favorite wine. Oh, okay. We all have favorite wines, and, you know, as, as we get more wines every year, of course, it's like, it changes. But right this minute, this is, I just was talking to him yesterday. I was going, gosh, have you tasted that recently? I was like, no, I'll be tasting it tomorrow. Now, if you'll smell this, this does have a little more new oak than, uh, than most of the wines, because the single vineyard wines, uh, we do a little differently. We make the wine, obviously, you know, open top fermentation, do a lot of punch downs, do the whole routine of, you know, a small winery. But then I don't just press. I, what I do is I drain off the free run first, straight into barrels, so that we're not just putting a lot of sloppy, you know, fluids into the press for no reason. Then we press the rest. So all of the single vineyards, this one and a, a number of the others, is, is pure free run. So this never even saw a press. I don't know. I just like that. <laughs> so it's like the cleanest of the cleanest. Boy, that is very flavorful. Yeah. Blueberry is the first thing I thought of. It's a blueberry. Am I getting blueberry in there? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There is a de there's a definite purity to this. And interestingly, Okay, so this is a clone, I think it's at 326 or 236. It's uh, 362. And clone 362 Grenache is planted a lot in this area. So we have this one, and this is right in, almost right in downtown Los Alamos. Then you go down just, oh, I would say two or three miles, and then uh, kind of north on uh, Los Osos Valley Road. And um, there's a vineyard called Martian Ranch where we also get Grenache from, the exact same clone, and they are so different. Where, where the Martian Ranch is like strong and manly, this is like just pretty and petite. And it just, it's, it's really amazing because the exact same clone and two totally different flavors. Now this is brought to us by Doug, uh, Doug Circle again, the same guy who used to own Sierra Madre Vineyard. He sold Sierra Madre Vineyard to Gallo about two years ago now, maybe two, yeah, and started Portico Hills right before that. Um, like I said, this guy's such a go-getter. Um, so yeah, he now actually just started another vineyard down in San Ynez, but uh, yeah, the Portico Hills, just lovely, absolutely lovely. So you just love going out there and trying to determine when to pick the grapes and oh, all yeah. of the, the fog coming in off the ocean and it's cool it's really and I can just, do you go out and help them pick? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as romantic as everybody talks about? <laughs> it's no romance and picking? You know, the other thing I just want to mention is I'm getting an aftertaste of pure strawberries. <laughs> my, my mouth right now tastes like nothing but strawberries and aftertaste. <laughs> I don't get it so much in the nose, 
And I wasn't getting all that much in the mouth, but as we started talking, it's like, I just feel like I just ate a whole bunch of strawberries. <laughs> That's funny. It's weird. Um, you know, a number of reasons. One, and I know, you know, the, the white hairs should bring it around, but I can't see at night when I drive. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys now, they start picking it like three and four in the morning so that they can get really cold grapes, which is great for us as a winery, but I can't go out and, and, and watch them even. I. I can't get to my car at that time of night. Yeah, I, I can't even get to the winery until the first light of day. So th that's just one of the realities. The other thing too, though, is farming has gotten so good and as it should because of the prices we're paying are so much now per ton. I mean, in the 1980s, I was paying $400 a ton for Pinot Noir and I was getting like every fifth ton free because there was no home. I mean, People would come around with with trailers going, can, can you use another ton of Pinot? Because I, I, you know, I can't. I, it's on the trailer. Got to do something with it. Now we pay. Well, the Sanford and Benedict, I pay close to forty eight hundred a ton for that. Wow. And we have to go pick it up ourselves. And we, I mean, there's there's all sorts of rules. Pretty much, if you breathe air in the vineyard, they're going to charge you. <laughs> but, but on the plus side is, man, people pick so clean now, and they're so careful with everything. It's it's a whole different different ball game. So so yeah, I don't feel the need so much to go out and make sure that you know they're a in my rows or or they're not throwing crap in and all that kind of stuff. It's just it's a much better deal now. And I've heard they go really fast with these sharp tools, and you really don't want to be anywhere near those guys because they're out there just. Well, doing I, the, you know, I the have to grapes and I. To be honest, I don't know how you can do that for a living and not lose the tips of your fingers. I mean, it's just, you have two hands in there, you got a sharp instrument in one, and you can't see what you're doing. Yeah. It's just like, these guys are so good. It's, it amazes me. It really does. It's, <laughs> you got to love that. Well, I can see why this is Will's favorite. This is really nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it's so eminently quaffable. That, that's the other thing, because uh, here again, low SO2, low tannin. And in the majority of them, fairly low alcohol, you don't really get hangovers that much with these wines. Um, it can be deadly because of that, but it's also just a nice, nice thing. It's just you know, you know, I can drink, I can drink this wine, wake up and feel fine. Other wines, not so much. <coughs> yeah. And smooth seems to be a running theme through your wines. I mean, this is the second That's bottle. I've still, got this, I've still got the same word to describe it. Yeah. Well, you know, I make these wines for me. That, that's the bottom line. I'm, I am lucky enough that, that Will wants what I make because I don't think I could work with somebody that wanted me to make a different style. I just, it would be against who I am and what I believe in. So that's one of the reasons that our partnership works so good is, is he actually likes this style too. But I make these wines for myself. I, I make them so I can drink them. That's, you know, I, <laughs> I make them to, to, yeah, to please me. <laughs> Oh. I, I'm, I'm thrilled the wine enthusiast is pleased too, but I'm the, I'm the first, I'm the first one on that list. <laughs> and at Pico Restaurant, you can get flights of your wine, can't you? Lumen wine. You can. And a lot of times they have what they call a unicorn flight, which is older wines that they use. Uh, one of, what is it? Coravins? You know, you, you push it down so, so it never gets any air in the bottle. And a lot of times I'll have one of my older wines on that. Mm. So well, that's how I'm trying to find one of the older magnums that, that he, he has online. <laughs> the, um, the, the Pinot Gris, which is the 18, we still have some of, now I don't know if people watching, uh, watching your, your, your feeds, if, they, if you ever talk to them about you know, how to get the wines or whatnot, but if you know, there, there's two vintages here that we've already changed. The 16 is available, but not on the website any longer. And the 18 Pinot Gris is available, but not on the website any longer. So if anybody wants those specifics, um, they can go to vintage club at lumenwines.com and just take their order through there if they want these specific vintages. Now, Pinot Noir is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's you my favorite. Are. And, and this, wine, wine enthusiasts love this wine too. They gave it 94 points. So this is a blend of Sierra Madre and then a vineyard called Gary Vineyard, which is over towards Presque Hill, which is on the south side of, 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 Sierra, of uh, Santa Maria Valley. 
and then also just a touch of Presque Hill Vineyard also. That is delightful. I taste raspberry. What's, what, what comes to mind when you taste it? I want to hear your expert opinion. Crunchy red fruits. Mm -hmm. So the, the red cherries, the strawberries, the raspberries, those are, those are the fruits that I get mostly. There's also some gorgeous herbalness to this one. Um, that's another thing that the Santa Maria Valley kind of always shows you is a, an herbality, not an herbaceousness, but herbality. Um, and then of course that sweet finish. After you have a sip, there's a sweetness that's left in your mouth that I just love. And it really makes you want to go back and have another sip. This one, the Santa Barbara County is pretty much the one I drink every night. Come home, I can open it up and I, you can just tell you, I mean, you can drink it without food. So, I mean, it, it's a beautiful sipping wine, yeah. but then you, it goes great with almost everything too. Everything but chocolate, never have peanut noir and chocolate. There's something chemical that happens in your mouth that turns the inside of your mouth into a really bitter flavor chamber for about 20 minutes. If you have chocolate and peanut noir, try it sometime when you know, when you, you don't care if your mouth's messed up for 20 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, it, just, it makes the bitterness in your mouth that you just cannot get rid of. Everything for the next 20 minutes will taste bitter. Oh, that's crazy. Because, oh. you know, a lot of people, they 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 love chocolate and wine and they don't I mean, yeah. noir chocolate, anything. Right. Chocolate yeah. and Cabernet, chocolate and Zinfandel, <laughs> everything is great. Chocolate and Pinot. <laughs> this is also made up of multiple clones. I didn't, We haven't really talked about clones that much except for the, the Grenache. But all the clones in this are the, the lighter, more elegant clones. So, 667, 777, 115. They're all the more elegant, genteel clones. This one, I haven't even tasted it yet, but you said it was harvested just after a solar eclipse. So you know yes. it's going to be special. Well, you know, now the, the people that do the biodynamic <laughs> would say that is special. <laughs> Definitely. Now, I think it's special too, but just for another reason, just because it was so cool. But um, yeah, we have a huge, uh, Will went out into the San Fernando Benedict Vineyard and stayed there for hours and finally got the perfect shot because it was an overcast day of the, the full eclipse of the sun. But then he has one little tendril of a, of a grapevine coming up. So it's beautiful. We've got this, it, it's massive. It takes up, well, our winery walls are huge, but it's, it's massive. It's a massive picture on our winery wall. It's so beautiful. So this is from the Sanford and Benedict Vineyard that we were talking we buy, about. Before. We buy grapes. We buy grapes there, yes. Well, I feel like this is really special. It is very special because, yeah, like, like you were mentioning earlier, this is Warner's first epiphany Pinot Noir for California. Um, I also made uh, the, some of the original Sanford and Benedict when they finally started selling to other people besides just keeping themselves. There was maybe five of us. Oh gosh, can I name them at this point? Hmm. Well, there was me, <laughs> the Hitching Post, there was Babcock, there was Ganey, and there was Obon Clement. Good job. That was the only people they sold to. Yeah. Hmm. And wine enthusiasts like this also, 93 points. Well, this is my big boy. This, this, <clears throat> this, this wine is not to be taken lightly, and it's mostly because of the clone. The clone is called 2A, and that clone is really a solid structure. I mean, it's the most manliest structure of the Pinot Noir clones, I think. I mean, there's some pomards, you know, that are, they get the, you know, the earthy, meaty kind of blood tank, but 2A structurally is probably the strongest structure you can get in a Pinot Noir. This is the only of all these wines we just tasted. This one is from the Santa Rita Hills Appalachian. So it's a different Appalachian. Mm. Uh, the ground is totally different as far as, you know, what it looks like. Uh, a lot of rocks, hard dirt. Um, I'm sure that you know there's words for all those stuff, but just say rocks and hard dirt. Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a viticulturalist. <laughs> But the Pinot Noir grapes had to struggle. Yeah, they definitely, and, and the 2A is a real, real solid, solid uh, clone. So this, this, yeah, and this is our, our most expensive wine too, um, just because it's it's the most expensive grapes that we buy. But, uh, and pedigree, it's, it's probably pedigree wise, the, you know. 
So the price, the prices on the wines has to do with how difficult it is to harvest the grapes or what, what all goes into determining a price of a wine? Um, well, the first thing we look at is how much grapes cost us. So these, as I say, are the very most expensive grapes that we buy. Um, and then the pedigree of the vineyard, uh, here again, Sanford and Benedict is, is the biggest, it, it's, it's the biggest pedigree as far as uh, name recognition. So uh, uh, therefore, and, and you know, uh, you're only allowed to buy only a certain amount. I mean, we can't just go in and say, hey, we want to up our contract. We only get one ton a year of this. So you know, it's it's pretty pretty minimal amount, um, and all those things go into making that the most expensive wine we have. So one ton would produce about how many cases of this? One ton will give you about two and a half barrels, so it'll give you about a hundred and twenty cases. Hmm. So this is precious. Yes, definitely. Thank you for and, sending it to us. Well, here again, this may on the on the website say it's only available with the club members. But here again, if you go to the whatever I just said, vintageclubsblumenwines.com yeah. and, and say you want it and you saw it here, they will sell it to you. Okay. I did see that there on the website. Yeah. So yeah. And this That's does well in cellar. It suggested five to 17 years in the cellar. Well, at, yes, at least. Um, the Lane Tanner wines, now I I did do those just slightly different, but they're almost the exact same style. My, I swear to God, and I'm not lying about this, my 89s of the Sanford and Benedict, still spot on. Hmm. Yeah, so so yeah, five to 17 easily, yeah. And who does that anymore, but. I know, <laughs> like we would yeah. never, <laughs> we would never store something that long. Yeah, because so much, so much of this, this Pinot, it's, it's made now, Everybody makes wine just to drink now, and and that's okay. But but aged Pinot Noir is so beautiful. It's so beautiful, and these can age. Mm. It's just a, like the three of us. We're probably past aging our wines. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're drinking them. I mean, we're not. We're drinking them exactly. I'll age it for maybe a year. You're not yeah, saving right. anything for seventeen years. <laughs> <laughs> Seventeen years, I'll be drinking fruit juice. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, Lane, this yeah. has been really, this has been really fun talking to you. Super fun, you guys, definitely.